It's 1985, and over in Europe, home computers such as the Amstrad CPC, Sinclair ZX Spectrum, BBC Micro, and the Commodore 64 were selling millions. These computers were cheap and accessible, versatile enough to run many different kinds of programs. But of course, their biggest draw were the games. Everyone from large publishing houses working on the latest movie tie-in games to the bedroom coder were coming up with that next smash hit and that lure to earn millions. Video games in Europe was a massive moneymaker, but as the sales of games increased, so did software piracy. In the early 8-bit home computing days, games usually came on two forms of media, cassette and the floppy disk. Both of them weren't difficult to copy. Cassette-based duplication was accessible to anyone who had a decent enough tape duplicator, and floppy disk copying was becoming more sophisticated as well. Software houses were aware that cassette duplication was hard to stop, so early forms of copy protection focused more on features that were baked into the game. In 1983, Matthew Smith's Manic Miner was a smash hit on the ZX Spectrum. The game is still considered one of the pioneering platformers and even ranked number 97 on Polygon's 500 best games of all time list. But because it had no copy protection, it was also one of the most duplicated games at the time. So for the sequel Jet Set Willy, publisher Software Projects wanted to put a stop to the casual copying, so they added a color-coded chart printed in the cassette inlay. When the program loaded, it would display random colors. To allow access to the game, the user would then need to match the colors with the chart and then key in the appropriate code. Simple and effective, yet pointless and tedious for the end user. Each time that they would load the game, they would need to go through the same process. Worse still, for users who were colorblind, vision impaired, or even playing on a monochrome display, it would be at best case difficult and at worst impossible to even play the game. And in the end, the color code chart was easy to duplicate anyway. Publishers were scratching their heads trying to solve the ongoing piracy problem. Anything that involved typing in a word from a manual could easily be photocopied and tapes could be duplicated, so an extra piece of hardware was needed. The use of dongles or ROM cartridges were not considered a viable option either as they would add significant expense to the cost. In 1985, a company known as ASAP Developments would come up with a copy protection method that didn't sit between the cassette or disc and the documentation. Rather, it would utilize one part that every user owned but could not be easily tampered with, the television. ASAP Developments would invent what's known as the lens lock, a small piece of plastic with transparent prisms that could be used to deflect light. By taking dots from a television screen and a row of prisms in a sequence, as the light from the television display passes through the prism, the dots can be scrambled to form words or patterns of recognizable characters. If the same prism sequence was used to scramble letters, then it could be used to unscramble them. Lenslock was simple and cheap to manufacture, and publishers quickly looked at its viability as an effective anti-piracy tool. The first publisher that would support Lenslock would be Firebird Software, with the legendary space trading game Elite. Elite was designed by David Brabin and Ian Bell originally for the BBC Micro in 1984. It was ported to many home computers and some game consoles, and it was a landmark release. It would contain an open-ended sandbox of space trading and combat with entire galaxies to explore. It was also one of the first games to utilize effective wireframe 3D and would go on to spawn three sequels, Frontier, Frontier First Encounters, and more recently, Elite Dangerous. Elite is considered one of the most important games ever made, and its influence can be seen in modern space trading based games such as EVE Online and No Man's Sky. In an attempt to combat piracy, Lenslock would be added to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64 versions of the game. When the game would load, the computer displays a scramble pattern. This is necessary to calibrate the lens lock. So I actually own an original Commodore 64 copy of Elite, which does come with the lens lock protection. So let's go ahead and see how people in 1985 were trying to get their copy of Elite loaded and see how easy it is to actually get through the lens lock protection. Is it 
a lot of hype and smoke and mirrors and a lot of misleading articles that were posted? Or is this genuinely a cumbersome and frustrating copy protection method? Let's go ahead and find out. So what we have here is the game Elite that's loaded on the lens lock screen. And I've got my lens lock right here. And we're going to try to get past this copy protection check. So I'm looking at the instruction sheet and basically I'm gonna read through it just to see how I can get this to work. Cause I've never gotten a lens lock protection to actually work for me. So it'll say a large H appears on the screen Using the keys specified on the screen, adjust the H until it's the same width, width of the lens holder. Put the lens on the screen like so, and then start pressing the arrow keys until the, the two lines match up with the lens itself, with the width of the lens. So let's go ahead and do that. And this is the calibration step that you have to, have to take. And I think that's, that's about right there. So let's call that good. And it says, now fold the lens holder into a U shape, ensuring that the words on the holder this side out and the large raised lens lock are on the outside. And it says, you will not be able to decode the characters on the screen if the lens is folded the wrong way. You may even break the lens holder. Hold the lens at arm's length against the screen with the feet of the lens firmly against the screen and the top on figure two. So what we're looking for are the words okay. And you can kind of see the words okay through the lens now. Um, I'm looking at, at the, uh, the screen there. Yeah, I'm looking at it front on and you can definitely make out the, the letters okay there. Um, it's a little pixelated and a little kind of all over the place, but it's definitely right. So I think we are calibrated. Let's see if we can figure out what this code is telling us. See, and th this, the difficult part is, it's really difficult to make out what this is saying. Um, is that a five? Is that saying five C? So let's try five C. Well, that didn't work, so let's try another one. And the, the thing is, there's a timer on this lens as well. So you only get like, I think it's like 30 seconds to make it make a choice. That looks like an E or a G. And the first one looks like a TG. Let's try TG. No, that doesn't work either. So let's let's try another one. Uh, let's see, what do we got? Is that a N and a R, R and D? I see an R and I see a D. R, D? That actually worked. So we, we, got, we got past the copy protection, but it took me three attempts to actually get past the lens lock. And ultimately this was one of the biggest issues with lens lock. The idea behind it was pretty decent, but the execution of it was just so tedious, pointless and frustrating that ultimately it was just easier to basically get a crack copy of the game and then play that. So with my test, I was lucky to get through the lens lock protection, but if I wasn't, I would have had three attempts to enter in the correct code and then what would happen is the computer would reset itself, I would have to reload the game again and then try and defeat the protection. Now on the Commodore 64 as you've seen, it doesn't really seem like a big deal when you load from disk, but keep in mind on a system such as the Sinclair ZX Spectrum where a copy of Elite came on cassette, it was a 10 minute load then followed by the lens lock protection check. And if you fail that, then you would have to reload the game, wait 10 more minutes, and then try again. So it's obvious how anti-consumer the lens lock protection ended up being. And in the end, it was just easier to acquire a pirated or a cracked copy of the game. Let's go ahead and take a look at the ZX Spectrum version of Elite through an emulator, and I'll show you how easy and trivial the lens lock protection is to crack. So the question is, well, how do we crack this protection? Because it is one of the most frustrating and just annoying versions of copy protection that ever graced video games. So this is very, very simple to do. And I'm going to show you one method of doing this. There are definitely ways 
that crackers probably did this in other ways and I am not an expert cracker by any means. I do know Z or Z80 assembly language and I know enough to be dangerous, let's put it that way. So when we're at this screen here, we're waiting for the code to be input in. What we wanna do is load up our debugger on our ZX Spectrum emulator. I'm using ZX or ZX Spin. There are different emulators that you can use, but we'll use ZX Spin because it does have a pretty good debugger. And I'm going to show you what that looks like right now. And as you can see, we're at this particular instruction, which is a halt instruction. So underneath that instruction is basically all the logic that is accepting the user input and then doing the comparison to ensure that the lens lock check is successful. We're not even going to worry about this stuff. What I'm going to do is look at the stack. This is the call stack. And as you can see on top of the stack here is the address C2AC. So if we jump to that particular address in memory, you can see that it's doing this particular jump into this particular memory location. So somewhere in our jump statement in C2A8 is that halt statement that we were just at. So let's go ahead and put a breakpoint on this particular address location. So the next time that we type in a code, say 63, as you can see, it's hit our breakpoint here. So what is actually going on this particular line? Well, you can see here, it's doing a instruction called JRC and then this location. So if we pull up our Z80 instruction manual or Z80 instruction manual, JRC and N basically means jump if C is set. So what that is basically telling us is if we go back and take a look, it's saying jump to this memory location if C, which is this flag here, the condition flag C is set. As you can see, it's set, it's been, it's been checked. Therefore, it's going to jump into this routine. But what if we unchecked C and ran execution, what would happen then? As you can see, we have basically bypass the protection. And that is a very, very simple way of doing so. There were 11 games in total that used Lens Lock with Elite being the first and the most popular. Now, I wanna mention that there were different lenses for different games. And there was also stories and reports that sometimes you were given the wrong lens for the wrong game, which means no matter how hard you tried to get through the copy protection because you had the wrong lens, there was no way you were ever going to get past it. While LensLock initially seemed like a great and cheap idea to stop the casual copying of games, in the end, its usage was short-lived. I have two separate copies of Elite for the Commodore 64. One of them uses LensLock, but the other copy, which is a later print, simply contains a fast loader and disk copy protection. Another title on the list is Silicon Dreams by Firebird. Once again, my copy has no trace of lens lock protection at all, simply favoring the more common manual protection. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this look at the lens lock protection. Very interesting to go back and revisit this stuff with real world examples as well. I do want to say it's awesome that I'm back in 2021. I'm looking forward to a fantastic year with you guys. We've got a lot of really interesting and cool content planned for this year, so stick around. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your continued support. As always, if you liked it, leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.